In early June 1566, the heavily pregnant Mary Queen of Scots took to her chambers in Edinburgh Castle. Three months earlier, her secretary and favourite David Rizzio had been brutally murdered by a number of her nobles with the complicity of her husband, Lord Darnley. Acting decisively, Mary detached her husband from his co-plotters, rallied her troops and appeared to have recovered the situation. But the decision to confine herself in the heavily fortified Edinburgh Castle for the birth was an indication that all was not entirely well. Against this background, Mary drew up her will on the 9th of June. Two copies were made and the Queen entrusted Bishop Leslie, one of her privy councillors, and who had been with the Queen on the night of Rizzio's murder, with their safe keeping. None of the three wills, the original or the copies, has survived. 300 years later, in 1854, Clark's looking through some unsorted legal papers in Register House here in Edinburgh made an astonishing discovery. A cache of inventories and accounts detailing the contents of Mary's wardrobe, her jewellery and books, a list of articles lost at Stirling Castle at the baptism of James VI in December 1566, and a list of the furniture destroyed at Kirkfield at the murder of Lord, Dun Lord Darnley in February 1567. And you can see uh, an extract from this, uh, the catalogue of the papers discovered. You can see um, this on screen. The plum item in this cache of documents was an inventory of the jewels of Mary Queen of Scots, annotated in her characteristic spindly italic handwriting with bequests to her French and Scottish relations, friends, courtiers and household in the event of her death in childbirth. Internal evidence enabled the inventory to be dated to the months preceding the birth of Prince James, and the document was immediately recognised as one of the treasures of our national archives. So this very faded um, image that you can see on screen um, is explaining that she wants this inventory to be executed in the event of the child not surviving me, uh, but if he lives, he is the heir to everything in the inventory and the bequests are as null. In 1863, Joseph Robertson, the antiquarian and historian, then on the staff at Register House, and who may well have been present at, present at the discovery of the documents, published transcripts of this inventory and the other newly discovered documents of her belongings with a very full and comprehensive introduction, which is still of great value today. While the inventory had clearly suffered from storage in damp conditions prior to the removal to Register House at an unknown date, the frequent display to favoured visitors over the intervening decades has resulted in the Queen's writing now being much faded. Robertson's transcriptions are therefore additionally valuable as they contain information no longer legible on the original document. In recent years, our conservation department has carefully conserved the inventory and it has been imaged so that in future it will be subjected to less handling. So on the left on the screen, you can see the facsimile of the final page of the inventory in Robertson's uh, publication and on the right is the document um, as it is today with uh, the a lot of the handwriting faded and on the image on the left at the very bottom you can see Marie R which is totally illegible practically in the image on the right hand side. Robertson describes the inventory as being in two gatherings tied together with a ribbon and secured with a seal. And you can see the slits on the right hand side um, at the top and the foot of the document. The um, ribbon and the seals have, have disappeared. The first gathering is described as the inventory of the Queen's borders or edgings, and is signed at the end by both the Queen and one of her four Marys, Mary Livingston, who is in charge of the Queen's jewellery. 
The second and smaller gathering describes jewel, jewels mainly of lesser value and is subscribed by her favourite chamberwoman, Margaret Carwood, who, as George Buchanan would have it, was privy to all Mary's secrets. Carwood was responsible for the care of the Queen's private cabinet. According to the English ambassador, Thomas Randolph, the cabinet was where Mary stored items she esteemed, quote, either for antiquity, novelty, or that she does take pleasure in. The document is written in French, as are the majority of the inventories and household accounts surviving from Mary's personal reign, and in a clerical secretary hand with the Queen's annotations in italic. And here uh, on the left, you can see Mary's handwriting in the uh, border of the document uh, with the secretary hand describing the jewellery on the right. The riches described in the inventory give lie to the belief that you still sometimes hear today that Mary handed all her jewels back to the French crown when she left France for Scotland. And bear out Bishop Leslie's statement in his History of Scotland that Mary arrived with many costly jewels and golden work, precious stains, orient pearl, most excellent of any that was in Europe. Mary had one of the most envied collections of jewels in Europe. And even John Knox admitted that, quote, she brought with her as fair jewels, precious stones and pearls as were to be found in Europe. Three main inventories detailing these jewels survive from the 1560s. The first from August 1561, before she set sail for Scotland, has 159 entries. The second in February 1562, 180 entries. And the third, the 1566 inventory under discussion today, has 253 entries. A later inventory taken at Edinburgh Castle in 1578 shows the treasury of jewellery a much diminished and depleted 85 entries. And I say entries rather than items because the lists don't always refer to one individual piece of jewellery at a time. For example, one entry in an inventory might be for several dozen bejeweled buttons or for three rings. A royal jewellery collection was never static. During the 1560s, Mary was continually adding to hers. In February 1562, the treasurer's accounts record that she redeemed a gold cross set with diamonds and rubies pledged to John Hume of Blackadder as security for a loan of a thousand pounds Scots to her mother, Mary of Guise. And in the months leading up to the birth of Prince James, she made several sizable purchases. In April, she paid £355 to James Malsman, an Edinburgh goldsmith, for rings and certain goldsmith work. And the following month, £2,000 to Guillaume Mignot in Bordeaux for unspecified goldsmith work and precious stones. And these are likely to be the pendants, gold chains and rings, which are identified specifically in the 1566 inventory as having been purchased recently by the Queen. So these are pretty sizable sums, but we know that the Queen also used money for, that she'd received from her dower lands in France to support her personal expenses and those of her household, though no accounts for this expenditure has survived. She must also have received gifts of jewellery from relatives and courtiers, as was customary at the time, though again little archival evidence of this survives. We know, for example, that Mary received a ring and an otherwise undescribed, quote, marvellous fair and rich jewel from her aunt and future mother-in-law, Margaret Countess of Lennox, in 1564. And the 1566 inventory, unusually, specifically mentions that the hat badge with ten rubies and a pendant pearl was given to her by David Rizzo, and she bequeaths this hat badge to his brother Joseph. Mary's collection was also a treasure store to be plundered for gifts given out to inspire and reward loyalty. And Mary was, we know, a generous benefactor to her relations and servants. And we can see that in other inventories of clothing marked up indicating where she has gifted them. Jewellery was also routinely broken up and the gems repurposed 
put in new, perhaps more fashionable settings, or unpicked and sewn onto a different garment, which makes comparison between all the different inventories of the jewellery quite tricky. The wearing of lavish jewellery and sumptuous clothing was indispensable for the Renaissance monarch. Jewellery performed a number of functions. The wearing of jewels was a powerful indicator of status. Only the elite could afford such jewels and only they also had the learning to appreciate their symbolic qualities. The gold, silver and gemstones had a huge intrinsic worth. For this reason, the inventory here details the specific number of gemstones in each piece, but not a very detailed description of the style of the jewel. Jewels were beautiful and decorative. They were rare and exotic. The 16th century was the age of exploration with the discovery of new sources of precious gems. Diamonds from India, emeralds from Colombia, rubies from Burma, sapphires from Sri Lanka, and pearls from India and the Persian Gulf. The gems were attributed with magical and medicinal properties, conferring virtues on the wearer, improving health, and with the ability to detect or provide protection from poison. In this respect, Mary's 1566 inventory lists a sapphire pierced for hanging from a chain, specifically for rubbing on the eyes, sapphires being believed to be efficacious in the treatment of eye ailments. Mary's inventory begins with the most valuable items in her collection, containing the largest and most costly gems, and starting off with impressive pendants, considered to be the most important type of jewel during the Renaissance, and which contained large diamonds, emeralds, and pendant pearls. Also listed are chains, belts, bracelets, earrings, filigree beads for containing musk, bejeweled buttons, and rings given, quote, as remembrances to recommend me to my good friends. And over 20 cents or sets or parure of jewels described here as accoustrement. So on the right, you see the hierarchy um, of jewellery as it is described in the inventory, starting at the top with pendants and going down to buttons at the bottom. Uh, and then you've got recent purchases, as I mentioned before, and the contents of the Queen's cabinet in terms of items that have gemstones in them. So if we look uh, on screen, you'll see a couple of examples of pendants from this period. Mary's pendants, of which there are 13 in all, are described as containing very large rubies, diamonds or emeralds, usually with a large pendant pearl, similar to what you can see in both of the examples here. Diamonds look black in the uh, any portraits that you're looking at. Um, and sometimes uh, foil was used as a backing to give them more luster, but they always appear um, black in portraits. And because faceting of gemstones was pretty basic at that stage, um, they are mainly uh, table cut diamonds, as you can see here on the right. So one of Mary's pendants is described as being in a cross, like you see on the one on the right portrait, and it's made of seven diamonds, made up of two table diamonds, two triangle cut, um, and one point cut, which means it was in a pyramid shape. And it also had two ruby cabochons, which are stones which were polished but not faceted, and the cross had a large pendant pearl uh, hanging from it. Now, the 1560s witnessed a change in the wearing of jewellery by the elite, um, particularly by elite women. 
a fashion for profusion, the wearing of multiple items of gold, heavily embellished with a mix of gems, semi-precious stones and pearls in particular. And the sets described in the inventory are very close to what we can see on the screen here. And they are composed of highly decorative edgings for headdresses, as you can see on the left, with front and back pieces called tour and oreillette. Uh, that's what in English Tudor terms would be termed the four and nether bilaments. And then you have the carcan or carcanet, which goes round the throat. Cotier, which goes around the top of the bodice, girdles or belts at the waist, and bracelets. And all of these would be decorated with combinations of diamonds, rubies, and pearls primarily, but also coral, amethysts, jasper, peridot, and garnets. And they might be enameled in black, white, red, and green. Now, on screen, if you look at the carcans or collars worn by um, both the women in the images here, uh, you can match it up with um, the descriptions on the right from the inventory. So you have what you have got is the main setting of the main gem in gold, which on the top is diamonds. And then between them, you have the link pieces, which are garnished with pearls. Now, buttons were used as fastening fastenings, but as here, this also referred to the clusters of gems or pearls applied over the surface of the garment, as you can see on the dress on the right. And the 1566 inventory lists many dozens of these, as well as aglets, the metal and jewel tips at the end of laces, as you can see on the sleeve of Elizabeth de Valois on the right with the ribbon and then the two metallic aglets. The inventory shows that Mary certainly had the wherewithal to encrust her clothing as richly as her European royal sister shown here. But we cannot be certain that she used her jewellery in this precise way as the visual and documentary evidence is so slight for how she dressed at this period. There is a lack of contemporary portraiture of her and witness descriptions are disappointingly rare. There is, for instance, a reference to the single pearl in her ear, as she liked to wear it. And on one occasion, to the very deliberate wearing of no other jewel but the ring, a gift from Elizabeth I, on a cord round the neck. So the very fact of this being specifically mentioned might suggest that normally she was in the habit of wearing a lot more jewellery. Two sections of the inventory detail sets of jewels made of scented filigree beads for containing musk or ambergris paste. Annas Keith, Countess of Murray, was bequeathed a set of jewels containing paternoster beads filled with perfume. In the 16th century, paternosters were not exclusively for rosaries, and sometimes these beads are also called pomander beads. And on the right of the screen, you can see the famous Pennycook jewels from the period of Mary's captivity in England, which were given to her servant Gillis Mowbray, and it shows the filigree beads which on examination by the National Museum of Scotland were found to contain remembrance of what is thought to be ambergris. The role of the perfumer at the malodorous Renaissance court was an important one. Scented clothing, gloves and shoes, beads and pomanders get you smelling sweet, but also surrounded the vulnerable 16th century body with a miasma of healthy air, keeping vapours and thus disease at bay. Mary employed her own perfumer, Ange Marie, sometimes named Angelo Maria, in the accounts, which suggests that he might have been from Italy, a country reputed for its expertise in making perfume. 
Such perfumers were also skilled in distillations for cosmetics and creams, scented waters used externally or taken internally, as well as allegedly poisons. Poison was viewed as a very real and present danger at Renaissance courts, a danger Mary was conscious of throughout her life. The inventory of the contents of Mary's private cabinet of 1561 records two long de serpents or tongue stones, which were actually fossilized shark teeth used to detect poison. She had perhaps inherited them from her Scottish royal forebears as, quote, a great serpent tongue set with gold, pearl and precious stains and two small ones set in gold are recorded as being stored in a coffer in Edinburgh Castle in 1488. And the items on the portrayed in the left are these tongue stones. And the long ye is a special item, a tree almost, if you like, which is um, displaying all these various tongue stones. When Mary was a young girl in France, an attempt to poison her food had been thwarted. And her fears appear to have been ramped up during her imprisonment in Loch Leven and later in England. In 1574, concerned that her food might be being poisoned, she asked the Archbishop of Glasgow to acquire terra sigillata, which was a mineral clay used as a proof against poison, or if this could not be got, a unicorn horn, quote, for I am in great want of it. Emeralds, diamonds, amethysts and aquamarine were all thought to neutralise poisons, but it was the rare and enormously expensive unicorn horn, actually narwhal tusk, which was prized as the best means of detecting poison in food and drink or on clothing. The unicorn horn was believed to change colour or to shake, if it came near poison. Mary's serpent's tongues do not appear in the 1566 inventory, but she bequeathed a unicorn horn on a silver chain, like this example on the right from the V&A, to her nephew Francis Stuart. And this may be the same jewel as that which Mary's half-brother, James Earl of Murray, attempted to sell in England in 1568, which is described as being very well made and richly decorated. The Zebeline or Martin fur was perhaps the most luxurious fashion accessory of the period. These were draped around the neck or hung over the arm as in this portrait. Mary owned eight of these and they are recorded in an inventory taken prior to Mary's return from France and it's likely she inherited others from her mother. Certainly the skills to create these opulent objects were available in Scotland, as the treasurer's accounts record Scottish gold being given to John Mosman in December 1539 to make a Martin's head for Mary of Guise. In the 1566 inventory, these prestige items are bequeathed to those closest to Mary, including her half-sister, the Countess of Argyle, her cousin Margaret Fleming, Countess of Athol, Annis Keith, Countess of Murray, Mary Fleming, Lady Livingston, and Annabella Murray, Countess of Mar, this last described by the reformer John Knox as, quote, a sweet morsel for the devil's mouth. Like so much in the Renaissance jewellery box, the Zibeline fur was suffused with meaning. Sables, martens, lynx and ermines, all known as weasels, were associated with fertility and childbirth. It was believed that weasels conceived through the ear and gave birth through the mouth, hence the focus on ears and mouth, such as we see in this Phoenician example on the right in Baltimore. And either side of the snout of this example, you can just see the holes which would have contained remnants of the natural whiskers. And in this example, the enamel tongue uh, moves. In the example in the middle from the portrait of Francis Sidney, you can see the pearls hanging from the ears and the little 
gold paws such as is described in the sable fur given to the Countess of Argyle um, up top, which is an extract um, from the inventory. So who were intended as the fortunate recipients of Mary's bequest? The inventory is largely a feminine document. In terms of the number and value of the bequests, women far outnumber men. A reflection perhaps of the more intimate and more female nature of the household of a queen and the type of jewels themselves. The male recipients, such as her husband Lord Darnley, her half-brothers or her privy councillors, receive buttons, gold rings, or objects from the Queen's cabinet, such as the hat badge in the shape of a siren set with 11 diamonds and a ruby bequeathed to the Earl of Bothwell. The bequests are also prim primarily to her close relatives, her intimates and inner circle, and her household, and overlook status and religion in favour of intimacy and loyalty top of their recipients was the Scottish crown itself, which received some of the choicest items listed, including the jewel known as the Great Hari, which Mary had received from her father-in-law, Henry II, and which she had worn on her wedding day to Francis II. And that's the described in the inventory, a great pendant jewel shaped like an H with the diamond and large capuchon ruby. Some jewels made up of particularly large diamonds are designated for future Queens of Scotland. And as you can see in the quote on the, at the bottom right, um, she specifies that their setting is never to change. They can't give them away. Um, but when they become queen, they receive them from whoever is in charge of the crown jewels. So here Mary is establishing a concept of inalienable crown jewels extending beyond the Scottish regalia of crown, scepter and orb. And this was surely influenced by the example of the French crown, which had taken the step in 1530, but was also perhaps informed by her own experience. Many of the jewels owned by her father, James V, have been sold to fund the wars against England in the 1540s. Jewel, uh, jewellery at this time has, with justice, been described as a fund to meet a national emergency, which was much more useful than coinage whose value rose and fell. So Mary specifies that the settings of these particular jewels are not to be altered, which was the fate indeed of the great Harry. On the succession to the English throne in 1603, Mary's son James incorporated the great diamond from the great Harry into the hat badge known as the Mirror of Great Britain, seen in this portrait of James VI. But there is no doubt which is the family closest to Mary's heart. Her Guise relations dominate the early pages of the inventory and scoop up the majority of the more costly and elaborate jewels. As with the Scottish crown, Mary also bequeaths collections of jewels, jewels in her memory to the houses of Guise, Omal and Elbeuf. For example, quote, to the house of Guise to remain forever with the eldest son. She leaves little to the aunts who had served as her ladies in waiting in France, focusing her largesse on the next generation. Her cousins, most of whom were still very young children on her departure from France. Generally, she favours her or her late husband Francis's godchildren, so it is unclear why so many items go to Catherine, daughter of Claude Duc d'Aumale. Though born in 1550, Mary might perhaps have retained stronger memories of her than her other cousins. One aunt is, however, favoured. René, abbess of Saint-Pierre-les-Dames in Reims, the burial place of the Queen's mother, Mary of Guise. Mary had been particularly close to the abbess and she is beneficiary of a large diamond studded mirror containing the image of the Queen of England. 
and two of the gold hearts Mary had received on her official entries into Scottish boroughs. The only other recipient then living in France and not a member of the Guise family was Marie de Bouquer, the Vicomtesse of Martigues, who had served as the Queen's Maid of Honour in France. Her reputation as a particular favourite is borne out by the richness of gifts given to her and her daughter, the Queen's goddaughter. These are some of the finest jewels in the inventory, including the third best pendant with a very large emerald, a set of headdress, carcan, potier of cabochon rubies and pearls, as well as the finest of the zibeline furs. Marie de Bouquet came from a family which had shown conspicuous loyalty to the Queen and her mother over a number of decades. And her parents had followed Mary to Scotland in 1561, remaining there for a year before returning to France. We are some way through the inventory, though still in the first gathering of more costly jewels before the first Scottish recipients appear. And these are the Queen's blood relatives, as this chart indicates. And blood, even if not legitimate, really was thicker than water. Jean Stewart, the Countess of Argyll, the Queen's half-sister and confidante, is a major beneficiary and the first Scot to appear in the inventory, receiving two full sets of jewels, a sable fur, as well as earrings and rings. The Countess of Argyll spent much time at court with Mary, away from her husband, whom she eventually divorced. She was with the Queen when David Rizzio was murdered, and later that year stood proxy for Elizabeth I as James VI godmother at his christening in Stirling. In line with Mary's gifts to her French godsons and daughters, her godson and nephew, Francis, son of a favourite half brother John Stuart, commendator of Coldingham, is particularly favoured in the inventory. While still a young boy, he had received several grants of lands from Mary, and now, as well as the unicorn horn, he's lined up to receive several dozen jewelled buttons and aglets, a chain decorated with rubies, diamonds and pearls, and from the Queen's cabinet, a painting of an unknown subject decorated with five rubies and one emerald. The Earl of Murray and his half-brother Robert Stuart also receive costly items from her cabinet, including a gold rose with 14 diamonds, a ruby and pendant pearl, and a cross with five table diamonds and three pendant pearls. Given the breakdown in his relations with the Queen after his involvement in the death of Rizzio earlier that year, it might come as a surprise to see Mary's husband Darnley's prominence in the inventory in which he appears 25 times. He scoops up the majority of the sets of jeweled buttons, including 404 feather-shaped buttons, enamelled in white, each set with a ruby, a pendant in the shape of the letter H, set with a ruby and with a pendant pearl, and a watch decorated with 10 diamonds and two rubies. And here is the entry shown on the right, which describes the bequest of the Queen's wedding ring, a diamond ring enamelled in red. It was with this that I was married. I leave it to the king who gave it to me. The surviving description of Mary's wedding to Darnley describes her husband putting three, th three rings on her hand with the main one a diamond ring and this is probably the one described here. So are these the dutiful bequests of a wife to the father of her unborn child and heir, who also remembers Darnley's parents, the Earl and Countess of Lennox, with some small bequests of rings. Less surprising is the appearance in the inventory of the Queen's childhood companions, the four Marys, who lie at the centre of a network of close-knit intermarried families with a long history of service to the Queen in France and Scotland, and which for some continued into her incarceration in England. 
These were not families of the highest status, but their ties with France were, were strong. Two of the four Marys had French mothers. Mary Fleming had the closest blood relationship to the Queen, being a granddaughter of James IV. A sister, Agnes, married Mary Livingston's brother, another the Earl of Athol. The Countess of Athol remained a supporter of the Queen throughout her life and in 1585 even offered to join Mary in her captivity. Mary Beaton's aunt was the mother of the Queen's half-sister, the Countess of Argyll. Mary Seaton's brother, George V, Lord Seaton, had spent his childhood and then been educated in France, later becoming the Queen's master of the household. Mary Seaton remained with Mary until 1583, when she returned to France. Bequests to the four Marys and their families appear mainly in the second gathering of the inventory, where, apart from the contents of the Queen's cabinet, the items are of lesser value. Each Mary receives sets of jewellery, but the borders for their headdresses, the chains and the belts, are mainly of gold enamelled in black, white, green or red, and are largely devoid of precious stones. And the four were not equally favoured. Mary Livingston, alongside her sister-in-law, Lady Livingston, receiving the most bequests, reflecting the closest of the Queen with the Livingston family. Mary Livingston's preeminence in the group is mirrored elsewhere. In a clothing account of 1562, for example, she's the recipient of double the items of any of the other Marys. And at the end, very end of the document, almost as an afterthought, and written speedily in the Queen's hand, are bequests of her linen to her bedchamber woman and the sale of her plate in her coffers for the benefit of her valleys, ushers and tapestry men. Almost in passing is, noticed, is noted the gift of the Queen's Greek and Latin books to the University of St Andrews to establish a library for the writing of a Bible. And the bequest of Mary's not inconsiderable library of French, Italian and English books to Mary Beaton, the most literary inclined of her four Marys. So who and what are missing from the inventory? Notable by their absence in any, is any member of the French royal family. Although the bonds with her in-laws were never as close as with her Guise family, there was one individual who Mary might have considered including, and that was Elizabeth de Valois, Queen of Spain, the close companion of Mary's childhood, and with whom she had shared a bedchamber growing up. Mary appears to have kept in touch with her, and shortly before her death in 1568, Elizabeth had apparently written to Mary, offering one of her daughters as a bride for Prince James. And surprisingly, there seems to be no mention in the inventory of the famous lustrous pearls Mary was given by her mother-in-law, Catherine de' Medici. There are certainly sets of jewels listed, containing numerous large pearl pear-shaped pear pearls, but if these are indeed the famous pearls, by 1568, with Mary imprisoned in Loch Leven, and when sent for sale in London, they were reported as being in six long ropes with 25 additional large pearls, described as being as large as nutmegs. So their earlier division into different jewels seems a bit unlikely. Valued by some London merchants as worth anything between £3,000 and £12,000, they were snapped up by Queen Elizabeth before Catherine de Medici could get her hands on them. Elizabeth retained them as ropes of pearls and James VI later gave them to his daughter Elizabeth of Bohemia, who is reputed to be wearing them in this portrait. So in conclusion, it is clear from our inventory that Mary owned a substantial, costly and fashionable collection of jewellery, which she had built up during her personal reign in Scotland. These jewels she considered to be her personal property, to do with as she wished and not belonging to the Scottish crown. Once in prison in England, she made repeated attempts to have her jewels returned to her. So what was Mary's thinking behind her bequests? The 1566 inventory is first of all a dynastic statement. Her bequests are to the two families which were joined in her person, the Royal Family of Scotland 
and the Guise family of Lorraine, both of which dynasties she intended would preserve her memory through their ownership of these heirlooms. The inventory is thus the embodiment of the Franco-Scottish connections forged during the reigns of Mary, her father and her mother. At the same time, it is a personal and intimate document which expresses gratitude for years of service and loyalty from her inner circle and those serving in her household, many of whom continued to support her either in person or from a distance in the years following her downfall. Okay, thank you.